three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 26, 2020 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz presiding. Um, we are holding this meeting uh, virtually pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued March 12th, 2020. Um, so this meeting will be held using remote participation. Um, it is open to the, to the public. We will allow public comment um, during the normal and appropriate time. Um, this meeting is being audio and video recorded um, and broadcast by Northampton Open Media, as is our normal meetings. Um, and we will uh, work through our agenda using the nomenclature of uh, Zoom conference, um, which has hands recognition and other features that, um, that we'll work through just like we would hold a normal meeting. So I'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call of the school committee. Member Voss. Present. Member Serafie Cox. Present. Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Gold. Present. Member Gold. Uh, Member Fallon. Present. Member Cox. Present. Present. Uh, Member Busanski. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. We'll begin the process now with public comment. Um, and I would ask those who wish to make public comment um, to, uh, if you can raise your hand virtually um, using Zoom conference. If not, um, I will unmute you. Um, I know that one person who has identified themselves to offer public comment um, is Jeff Jones, a Northampton resident. Um, and I will ask uh, Mr. Jones to please provide his public comment first. Thank you, David. Um, I sent in a written uh, comment um, earlier this afternoon, but um, I live at 76 Woods Road, uh, Ward 6 in the city. And um, my regular job I work for United Food and Commercial Workers Local 1459 that represents um, the school bus drivers who drive for Durham School Services, <clears throat> who in turn have um, a contract with the district. And I'm just here um, to try and ensure that um, the drivers are treated fairly. I would first want to uh, it's my understanding that the district has agreed to uh, pay the drivers for last week and this week for um, lost wages, and I commend them for doing that. Um, and going forward, I know on the agenda, there's a um, discussion that you folks will have about going forward. And I would only say that um, these people work extremely hard. Uh, they work odd hours they have a regular shift. Sometimes they have charters in the middle. Sometimes they have charters at the end. And um, this is a very difficult time. It's kind of an extraordinary uh, time we're going through right now. And I think it um, calls for extraordinary responses. So I'm here to speak um, and um, add my support to continuing to support the uh, Northampton um, drivers that are um, driving for Durham, Durham School Services. I'm not here to speak for Durham School Services themselves. I'm sure um, they can do that themselves. So that's all I have to say and thank you very much. Mayor, you're muted. Mayor, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry. Good lip reading there, Ronnie. Um, I um, I wanted to just see if Mr. Harrell wanted to offer public comment um, during the um, regular uh, portion. Um, Mr. Harrell, um, did you wish to offer public comment to the school committee this evening? Hmm. He's there and I've unmuted him. So, um, okay. 
Mr. Harrell, can you hear us? Okay. Well, um, all right. I will remute his audio. Um, is there anyone else? I don't see anyone else on this uh, conference other than the participants and those from Northampton Open Media. Um, so I will close the public comment period and I will move to announcements. Are there any announcements uh, from members of the school committee? If you'll raise your hand virtually to let me know about those. Uh, okay, um, hmm. someone just waiting to get in, um, Molly. Okay, um, okay, so there's no announcements at this point. So I will now move to reports and recommendations on the agenda. And I, the first item that had been scheduled on our agenda uh, was a I discussion. Think, Mayor, sorry, I yes. think member Fallon is trying to get your attention. Yeah, my hand raising's not working. Okay. Apparently it's giving you thumbs up rather than raising my hand, so. Hmm, and so when you go over to uh i hmm that's interesting uh can Perhaps, someone else are you yeah. on a computer yes okay. are you using the reactions or are i you did accidentally use the reactions didn't i yes yeah so yeah. go into participants found it thank you yeah i appreciate your thumbs up though that was yeah so i did have an announcement is welcome okay all right i'll turn to uh member fallon for an announcement um, I wanted to let the committee know that I appreciated so much the vote to um, allow me to use professional development money to go to the NSBA conference, but obviously that has been canceled. Um, the money has been refunded in full. Um, and that I also wanted to let you know the um, MASC Day on the Hill has been canceled as well. Um, and that if any of you are interested, yesterday the um, Massachusetts Association of School Committee launched a new um, feature on its website from under member resources. It's frequently asked questions um, that staff are responding to during the pandemic. Um, so if any of you are interested, yesterday's um, was the first and it was shared with you. They did frequently ask questions about virtual meetings and they'll be continuing to provide um, information to school committee members during this time. So I just wanna let you know about that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Fallon. Okay, any other any other announcements? Okay, so now we move to reports and recommendations, and uh, the, we had scheduled um, discussion and possible vote on the 2021 uh, budget. Um, obviously, the superintendent uh, sent out an email earlier uh, today, I believe, um, and I wanted to turn to the superintendent. Uh, to sort of discuss that in the context of where we are now versus where we began this budget process. Superintendent Provost. Thank you. Um, it was actually yesterday that I sent out that communication. Oh, um, sorry, the days okay. are blending together. Sorry about that. For me too. Um, so my concern is that this feels very similar to two, two times uh, in my my experience as a central office administrator, one was 2003 and the other was 2008 um, when the state ran and national economy ran into trouble in the middle of the year and money was pumped in in order to try to stabilize things and to get people through the end of the year. However, in the next year, it was necessary to implement austerity budgets because all of the reserves had been spent and the economy had not yet recovered. Um, one of the things that we're hearing from the state level officials is that we shouldn't expect the state to be able to make even the kinds of commitments of support that were being discussed two weeks ago. So we see that this, the state level funding is melting away. I think the federal level funding is likely to melt away for FY21 as well. And um, who knows about the local economy? Um, it certainly doesn't help when um, our, no one is able to use our local businesses. Um, so I, I expect local revenues to be down as well. So I would anticipate that all three sources of our 
funding for schools are going to be impacted by what we're currently going through. And so I'm recommending that we take a more defensive stance with respect to budgeting for next year. And so I've been working with my team to sort of pull back on some of our requests and try to think with a um, more, I would say conservative mindset um, with the expectation that we may be in an uncertain financial situation even beyond the beginning of the fiscal year and maybe looking at potential cuts in the middle of the year. Um, so I don't wanna extend ourselves too much at this time and then find that we're creating, um, we're putting ourselves in peril for the next fiscal year. So um, Cami and the alt team had worked on some adjustments to our budget requests. And I think that that document was shared with you all. And with that, um, through the chair, I'd, I'd ask if Cami could speak about some of the adjustments that we'd recommend just based on the information that we're privy to at this time. You're, you're muted again. Well, without objection, turn it over to Cami. Good evening. Um, so Superintendent Provost and, and I have been talking quite a bit the past few days because um, I have been getting information from uh, the DESE financial people and, and they're already warning us that this is gonna impact 21's budget no matter what. So it's a matter of trying to, to plan for it. Um, like. Superintendent, I, I've lived through this twice already, having done this 22 years. Um, so I'd rather plan ahead instead of being caught halfway through the year and then have to make some drastic changes and decisions. Um, the budget that was proposed um, had a number of new positions that we were trying to um, support some of the services that we needed in the school. So the administrative team looked at that list um, and revised it. And that's what I emailed you this afternoon. This was the worksheet that we've been working off of originally as, rather than a, the formal presentation that Dr. Provost did. Um, so I just wanted to go through it because that way you could see some of the items that um, we had talked about that we were no longer going to be um, putting forward as trying to add to the budget. Um, so, in the document that you had received this afternoon. Can I just ask, um, Kimmy, can I just ask Annie, can you share that document? Yes, I can. Okay, just so that um, it's on the screen for the public that will yep. be viewing. I was just going to ask if you needed yep. me to do yes, that. Yes, please. There it is. Everybody see okay. it? Uh, it's, it's coming. There we yeah. go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what we had originally done is, uh, this is my worksheet that I was working off of when we were building the entire budget book. Um, so the first gray column that says new item cost, that's where we had all the additional items. Um, and what we've now done after discussing it with the ALT is we've now moved a number of those items into the no longer added column. So although we've advocated that we still need those things, now is not the time to recommend adding them. Um, so for instance, the SEL coach, we've now put that we are not proposing to fill that position, a new position. So every item that is in the blue column was previously proposed and is no longer proposed. It, if you take a look uh, about three quarters of the way down, the transition educator position for 58,000 is still in that first gray column for 58,000. That item we are still recommending would stay proposed because one of the things that we've looked at is there's also the savings to equal that. And those were some of those set pieces that we had discussed. If we reduce any of those items, we can't reduce the savings on the other side. Um, so we felt it was much better um, support and services for the money to implement those four new things. So the transition educator, the transition coordinator going to full-time, um, which those two positions are mainly because of the number of students that will be in that program next year. Um, also a BCBA at JFK and also a BCBA at the high school halftime. Both of those 
um, services would be on staff. Right now we are contracting out, so we're not getting as many hours of service by contracting out currently. Um, Annie, I don't know if we can just move it down or if you need to. I'm trying to move it down. That's yeah, okay. It doesn't seem to want to move down. Hold on. There we go. All right. Perfect. Is that, is that far enough? Yeah. Um, I think there's actually one page in between. So I think that jumped to the third page. Okay. Hold on. First page. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Um, so same situation going on. Um, with the second page, the uh, physical therapist, we're not um, recommending to increase the point two. We are recommending for Ryan Road an additional ESP for a student that needs that service next year. Um, the nurse for pre-K, we are gonna be able to fund that from a grant for next year. Um, let's see what else. The family student engagement quarter, although we find it would be a very important thing to have, now is not the time to do that. Um, the care coordinator, uh, half time, we are going to keep in because that's a grant requirement. The grant is paying for the other part of that salary right now. Um, nope, I have the nurse and pre-K in two different places. Um, so that's one thing that we're not going to move over. The LPN, originally on the list, we had proposed it for district coverage at JFK and the high school. We were going to take that off the list, but since that time, we've also have a pre-K student that needs, for medical reasons, needs a one-to-one -one LPN service. So that is gonna remain on the list for next year. The Project Lead the Way educator is not gonna be recommended. Uh, the GCC tuition will be. Um, the laptops, we will not. The high school um, clerical person for the 504 will not. Um, Annie, if you wanna go to the next page. There we go. Um, the building-based budgets, we will still propose to increase it since that's what the principals use for a number of different items in their building and their costs will be going up. The textbook, this is for current, uh, for new adoptions. We originally had proposed $30,000. Uh, the administrative team felt it was important to leave $20,000, but we would reduce it by $10,000. Uh, the 70 drivers for the vans, we originally had proposed having two drivers. Um, at this point, we're still recommending to have one driver. And so we're only gonna re recommend one, not the two, because we still would be able to service people and have some homeless reduction for a contracted service. So we would pay for a good portion of it. Um, the 504 academic testing piece of JFK, the half time would still be recommended and the data system for um, $9,000 would be recommended and still recommending the loss of Clark School rental. Um, on the column that's to the right side of the blue column, the savings and other funding, those items are still remaining in place that we would still make those reductions. So I don't know if you wanna start at the first page and I can go down them or um, maybe that'd be the easiest way. There we go. Um, so we are looking at uh, Jackson Street would be reducing one special ed position, which is the loss of a floater position. Bridge Street would be um, losing one special education position. Um, the next four items down in the special ed service are contracted services, and that's that set piece again. Those are those four items that are paying for the same dollar amount, just a different way of implementing them. Uh, Let's see, we have Ryan Road is gonna reduce a half-time special education teacher. Um, JFK would be reducing a half-time library ESP. JFK would be reducing one exploratory teacher. Um, high school would be reducing a 0 .33 science teacher. And page three has, uh, we're gonna reduce the $10,000 out of the homeless contracted service. Uh, line item for contracted services. Um, the athletic transportation will reduce by 8,500 and the school lunch price would increase by the 15 cents, which would generate $13,500. So given all of those 
additional items and the savings we have there, we're within $5,400 of balancing each out of those. The blue column of what we had originally proposed to be added is equaling $560,000. So at this point, we would not be recommending that increase of $560,000. So what that means bottom line right now is we originally had proposed a 5.4% budget increase. This would bring it down to a 3.65% increase with using some of the school choice money to offset this budget piece as well. Okay, um, do members want, uh, Superintendent, do you wanna add anything to that before I take questions from members of the school committee? <clears throat> Superintendent? I just wanna thank my team. Um, like many of you, we've been rushing from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, trying to um, coordinate as we learn this new way of working and also um, trying to make decisions that are very difficult in an extremely trying financial environment that we're heading into. So um, we, we were able to do this work collaboratively in a short period of time. And so I think that they, they obviously don't um, present the same type of services that we were hoping to be able to provide for the district at the time we put forward this original budget but it does put forward um, a level of services that we think is likely to be more sustainable in the economic waters we're heading into. And would you consider this superintendent, so this would still be maintaining, mostly maintaining level services across the district, but just not making the additions that um, overall? More or less level service, yes. Okay. Okay, um, do members of the committee wish to ask questions about this? Please, um, please raise your virtual hands. Uh, member Serafie Cox, I'll recognize you first. Thank you. Um, I am struck by the statement that this is a level budget, level service budget uh, when the budget was brought to us that had the 5% increase that was um, characterized as a level service budget. So I'm wondering um, how, how you square that hole, if that's the nomenclature. Sure. Uh, so as I said, it's more or less level service budget. What I mean is this is a budget that doesn't require us to implement a hiring freeze at this time. It still allows us to replace positions of people who are retiring or people who leave, but it, it certainly is much less than, than the budget that we had first brought forward. The next person whose hand is up is member Levy. Thanks. Um, I recognize the challenges that we're facing right now given just the uncertainty. And so I really appreciate the work that, that Superintendent Provost, your team has done to really try and, and predict what's unpredictable. So thank you for the work. I think for me, I still have a lot of the same questions that I did with the initial budget proposal, which is um, when we're looking at cuts before, before I feel like I can say yes to any proposed cuts, I need to really understand how those cuts are gonna impact the lived experience of the students and the teachers in the classrooms. And um, I, I completely understand that you have been working. I, I can't even imagine the hours that you've been putting in with everything. Um, and there's my questions still remain and haven't been answered. And so I think for me, my questions very much are, if these, if some of these, these um, that look like, and if some of these cuts are going to go through, what does that look like? So I'm thinking about at Leeds, the 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 fact that we're not going to add a first grade teacher. What does that mean? Will result? How many first grade classes will there be? How many students will there be in those classes? Um, and same thing with some of these other cuts, like special education. We had asked for a better understanding of numbers. 
Um, and I still very much need to see those numbers to understand those cuts. Member Gold. Um, yes, um, so it's thank you all around again. Um, and I'm wondering, and sorry, I, I, uh, my connection broke out at the beginning of um, the presentation right here. So I missed a couple of it. So I don't know if this was shared or not. Is there, do you have in, any thoughts about doing sort of like you had to do with the override where there was two budgets? Um, do you have any thoughts about doing, not necessarily two budgets, but, but a way to say like, if things get, if more money is available, like what would come back in that's no longer added, you know what I mean? So prioritizing that. And then just a clarifying question, just from Member Levy, Sharon, was the leads thing specifically first grade or was it just a general ed? Uh, John, do you want to respond to that? Yes. So, I, uh, I, I, we definitely can put together a prioritized addition list for the committee if that's helpful. Our thought at this point was that it would be better to go into the year conservatively, and then if the situation turned out to be better than we anticipate, it will will be. Then we have the opportunity to potentially add positions, rather than to hire people who we may not be able to maintain. Um, not only because it's not moral to take on people who you, you may have to end up um, very soon reducing, but also because it's not efficient because there are unemployment costs associated with that that we're trying to uh, protect the district from. So um, we, our philosophy at this point is to try to come in as conservative as possible. And if things turn out to be rosier than expected to have the opportunity to be able to move forward and potentially add positions. And yeah, I guess that's um, where, I th you know, and, and just to follow up on that, that's what I was thinking, like if there was for anyone, including myself, who might, you know, be wondering um, the impact of the cuts, knowing that priority list, like coming back in would be helpful to know, all right, you know, yes, we know this is gonna be an area of need. This is why, if monies are available, we have this prioritized on how to quickly address those. Um, and then could, and Dr. Provost, could you just clarify that first grade um, leads position? Is it a first grade position or is it a general ed position still? Or is it specific to a grade it's, level? It's general ed. Um, I think that might be a mistake. I thought we had determined that that was going to be a third grade position. Yeah, sorry. I, I realized I was conflating the the first grade ESP with a general ed teacher. I'm just wondering, though, Superintendent Provost, if you're able to respond to my questions. Uh, in terms of the special ed, reductions I think I can speak to because those are the same reductions that we've been discussing from the beginning. Um, so the special education change at- Rich Superintendent, can, can I just interrupt you for one moment? Sure. Annie, could you take down the shared content right now? Um, I'm getting reports that people at home can only see the shared content who are watching on Northampton Open Media. So could you take down the shared content for now? Okay, thank you. All right, continue, Superintendent. So the, the special education changes at Bridge Street who were discussed at the prior meeting. It would be the, really the difference in the two third grade classes now that each have a special education teacher going into two fourth grades next year with one shared special education teacher. The caseloads there would change from a one to four ratio for the special ed teacher to one to eight ratio, because um, eight, eight students split over two classes. The impact at Jackson Street would be um, even less, in, less impactful. Um, essentially what we have now is a situation where we, basically have a teacher with a caseload of zero. So I think removing that um, position will have no impact on the, the, um, uh, on the special ed caseloads at Jackson Street. The uh, impact at Ryan Road would be um, slightly more. Uh, we have a teacher right now who works with a small uh, number of students in pullout um, receiving 
individualized reading instruction, that would be the impact, that would be the position that would be lost in this. We would still uh, attempt to provide those services, but with less staff. But so I think the impact would be somewhat more heavily felt at Ryan Road. Um, with respect to the, the other positions, uh, leads in particular, we're talking about maintaining the same, the same kinds of staffing that we have this year. So we've had uh, a lot of discussion about the second grade class sizes being large. Currently it's 24 and 23. Um, so the impact would be that those large class sizes would move up to third grade next year. I will point out though, that the third grade classes at Jackson Street right now are 23, 23, 23. So we're talking about really only one student over um, that number in one class at Leeds. Uh, similarly, the first grade ESPs um, are resources that we currently don't have in the district. We advocate for them because we think they would be helpful, but in, in given the uncertainty of the waters we're heading into, um, we, we feel that it's hard to continue to advocate for that, knowing that right now um, we're able to provide the education our students need without that resource. Okay. Um, did that address your some of your questions, Member Levy? Um, you're muted. Uh, Member Levy? Sort of. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll let my colleagues ask questions and then I'll, I'll follow up if, if. Okay. Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you, Superintendent Provost and um, your staff for doing this. I, do, I certainly appreciate the foresight. I, I'm wondering about a couple of things. Um, it's, we, we just, I, I know I just received this um, new table just before our last meeting. So I haven't had time to view it. Um, what would be helpful, I'm wondering if it's possible just to produce pretty quickly um, something similar to what you had in, our, in the budget book that's called the FY21 budget staffing changes. Um, and if you can just update that as well as other sort of changes now that um, brings us up to speed with what you're currently endorsing. Okay. <clears throat> Member Serafik. Oh, did you have any more questions, Member Kaufman? I was just wondering, Superintendent Provost, is that possible to do? Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. And um, because some of it, so much of our budget is dependent on the city, Mayor Narkowitz, I'm just wondering, um, how do you feel about this? Is this something you were gonna ask us to do? Do you, do you have any other insights from the governor um, or from the new, um, I know, uh, hundreds of millions, if not a couple of billion dollars is gonna be coming into states from the federal stimulus package is any of this um does any of this new information need to be considered as part of our thinking so we're hearing many of the same things um you know if you've been hearing the reports of um of uh transportation revenues dropping precipitously um everything from gas taxes to the mbta um, we're expecting the legislature to be tightening in terms of what they're providing. Certainly some of our most important revenues, meals tax, um, hotel motel tax, um, even recreational marijuana now is shut down statewide. Right. So several of our, and parking obviously is another revenue source. So several of our local revenue sources, we're expecting major shortfalls over the summer. And we don't know when those or at least into the spring, and we don't know when those will recover. Um, yes, there's stimulus money coming in. Yes, there's money that's going to be directed to, towards small businesses and loans. Um, and, um, and there's some community development block grant money coming from the federal government, um, which will we view as helping to support social service needs, as well as potentially small business and economic development or housing. Um, but in terms of what will be coming directly to support um, municipalities, that yet remains to be seen. The governor has filed legislation today uh, or yesterday 
um, to basically extend all the tax payment deadlines um, for everything from excise tax to property taxes. Um, so uh, I think we're going to start to see um, municipalities, particularly smaller municipalities, start to run into some cash flow problems in terms of um, their ability, particularly as they are committed to paying all of their employees throughout this. So um, we we were al already taking a very conservative approach on the city side with this year's budget in terms of um, not we were not proposing uh, to add any new positions on the city side at all at this point. Um, so we're in that same posture. And again, the chapter 90 money, the chapter 70 money, um, all those monies flow to the city through our cherry sheet. So we um, are concerned as Dr. Provost is concerned that we are going to see um, shortfalls. The governor obviously filed his budget which seems like years ago now. Um, the House is supposed to file a budget in April, but I don't know how, how that's going to be impacted by the current situation as they're trying to figure out how to meet virtually just to pass basic legislation. So we don't even know if we'll have a state budget um, on time this year or not. So that's my uncertain um, sort of forecast for where we are. Okay. We're Thank definitely in, yeah. in uncharted waters. Right. It sounds like a bunch of unknowns. Well, this, this sort of um, more conservative approach sounds very wise to me. So thank you for um, everybody who was involved in the thinking this way. We can certainly always revisit, you know, what if we get past this, we can always revisit and, and, and add to a budget. It's just difficult if you create a budget and then you have to lay people off because then you have the added expense of unemployment because the city is self-insured for unemployment. So that adds a whole additional expense. So if we add positions um, and then we have to start reducing positions, we'll probably need to reduce additional positions beyond the positions we need to reduce in order to be able to afford to pay the unemployment. Right. So that's the other challenge. Thank you. Um, the next person whose hand is up is member Serafi Cox. Thank you. Um, Cami, I am wondering if you could um, help me understand what this means by swap. So under JSS and BSS, it says swap sped teacher salary lowest seniority. Can you tell me what that shorthand means? Uh, I can to some degree. Um, so Bridge Street, we had looked at um, what happens in when there is a position elimination, it's actually the lowest senior member is actually the position that, that would be lost. So that's where it would swap out with someone else. So we would eliminate a position, a person's in it, they're more senior, they're gonna swap and bump out somebody else. So we had to represent the lowest senior members dollar amount in there, not necessarily the position that would be cut. Oh, I see, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I will just voice um, concern, uh, continued concern uh, about the uh, special education teacher. Uh, I know the most, of course, about Bridge Street, and that is what I have heard the most about um, from my constituents. Although, of course, at our last meeting, we heard um, about uh, concerns at Jackson Street as well, and it sounds like uh, the superintendent thinks that uh, the impact would be bigger at Ryan Road. So um, I I hear the um, the need for this conservative posture, and I do agree with it. Uh, but I continue to have concerns about taking teachers out of um, out of classrooms uh, and. Um, I know quite a lot about the, uh, the particular special education uh, situation at, at Bridge Street um, and, and would be worried about that. Okay, um, Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna just echo some of what I've heard and add a couple of thoughts. So first of all, thank you for this 
unfortunately needed revision. Um, I agree with what everybody said that we need to be far more conservative based on what will almost certainly be loss of state and local revenues. And at the same time, I'm really concerned about the elementary, I'm concerned about all the schools, but what we've heard as a committee and what I've heard a lot from people the last few years and this year is no exception, is the need for more teachers, ESPs, grownups to be interacting every day in the classrooms um, in the elementary schools. So I just, I really share these concerns and um, I sh they're even more so because if schools closed potentially, well, it's closed until May and it could be closed longer. Um, kindergarten kids are not going to be normal first graders next year. They're going to have that much less time. And now we don't have the extra ESPs in first grade. Um, and I just see that same dynamic in every grade in our school system. And I think that's really important to start thinking about. I think the superintendent, I'm sure he's already thinking about that, but how do we use the limited budget we have to also support the fact that our kids are gonna have to catch up and it's more than just their academics, it's learning how to be a year older without having these weeks of school. So I'm, I'm, I feel like we need more adults and more teachers in the classroom and cutting, I'm, I don't have the expertise to say, should they be the special ed teachers? Should they be ESPs? What should they be? But the current elementary school classrooms seem like they need more. And I guess I just maybe ask that we could leave that, leave this conversation at least with that on the table and come back and wonder uh, and see if there's, there's alternatives or what the alt team or what the community who works in these classrooms says might work. Um, and, you know, to go out on a limb to say maybe there's things in our budget that any other year we would not want to cut, but they're one time things like, you know, I always the one that says we need more textbooks. Well, maybe this year we don't have a textbook item and maybe we have less professional development because our teachers might not have as much time for it because of what's going on right now. I don't know if those are the right things to cut, but maybe there's things that aren't people that we can look closer at. And it's a really different hat than was on when it was override versus no override. But I just really think we're going to need more adults in the classroom. I'm done. You're not, you're muted, Mayor. Sorry about that. I'm trying not to have my drinking water be heard around the world. Um, so, um, okay, Member Gold, you're the next person who with a hand up. Um, yes, I was just wondering um, in regards to uh, follow up on Member Kaufman's um, questioning, is it, is it, realistic for us even to have a have a 3.5 um percent or whatever the percentage was i forgot what it was but is there even the is that realistic are we are we overshooting ourselves as you know going beyond what is financially feasible with that as well or, or do you feel comfortable uh mayor narkowitz with that increase was that question directed to me member gold um, yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah, okay. or, 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 or you, or Ms. Lamica, or who, I mean, whoever, whoever can answer it, whoever is best to answer that one. I mean, um, member, um, uh, John, do you want to discuss in terms of what our, we, we need to be able to meet some of our basic obligations, um, and, and so my understanding is that this will, we'll still be meeting those um, contractual obligations, um, but and so I think we have that commitment. So you know, this is what it will take to maintain. Obviously, not the level we were hoping for, um, but this is this is what it will take. Then we'll work to make it work. Again, I'm saying that without having seen a House of Representatives budget at this point. Um, that's you know, the governor has presented a budget that was in a totally different environment. And we're we're waiting to see what a house budget will look like um, at this point, or you know, much less a house senate and then a final budget from the state. So I'm comfortable moving forward with this. Um, obviously, I like 
all of us, I don't want us to, to be backing away from the things we were talking about, you know, two, three, four weeks ago that we were hoping to be able to add to our district, but, um, but I'm comfortable trying to make this work. Obviously, give, with the caveat that there's still a lot that's unknown. Thank you, that, that does answer it, thank you. Um, John Provost, you had your hand up next. So I think uh, I'll start with the question that you just posed to me, which is what our contractual obligations are. So that's actually how we start building the budget. So that's a number that I think Cami is familiar with, not to put you on the spot, but do you know what just the contractual increases amount to? Um, I, I'd have to look that one up. That wasn't one that I haven't looked at the exact number, so I'd have to check. Okay. Um, my, my expectation is that the percentage that is on the table now is pretty close to the amount that would be just needed for the contractual increases, because in most places where we're adding something, it's being swapped out for something else. Um, so I think that most of what you see is the contractual increases there. So that's that's the amount. Um, I guess I, while I have the floor, I just wanna say, look at, this is not a recommendation that I wanna be making at all. You know, and I'm not, the, the reason that I'm trying to defend this proposal is not because I think it's the best proposal, I, it's because I think it's the best possible proposal at this time. I agree with so much of what you're saying about the, impact that not adding the positions we were talking about in my first proposal is going to make. Um, you know, and there may be better ways of doing it. You know, there were four months of labor that went into creating the draft budget. And we really had two weeks to try to make revisions, which has really come down to about two hours because between closing school, setting up online distance learning, setting up um, a feeding program, there's been very little time for us to work on this as a district. Um, I think that there is another way of, of looking at this and it goes to the point that member Voss was making, which is not only do we have the, the fact that we're not getting what we thought we would be helpful to move the district forward, but we're going to be having kids who present with exponentially larger needs than we thought they were going to have when we were proposing that other budget. There's never been a nationwide shutdown of public education. And there's going to be a need to catch students up like there's never been before when we come back to school again. So another way of looking at this might be to say, maybe nothing is in the budget for next year and we start just adding in positions from those that are most important to provide equity for the students who are hurt most by the shutdown and then see what we have left to, to do the rest of the operations afterwards. And that may be the best way to do it, but we really just haven't had an opportunity in the, in the short period of time since the shutdown to go back to that basic level. But that, I mean, that, that certainly is something that has been on my mind and something I've been thinking about. It's just um, overwhelming to think about going to a zero based and building back based on equity. But that, I mean, that, that's the challenge we're going to have. I, I totally agree. Not only are the students coming to kin first grade not going to be, you know, presenting with the typical maturity and skill level that we would expect first graders to have based on a full kindergarten experience, but all of our students in every single grade are going to be having skills gaps. And the skills gaps are going to disproportionately be impacting students who don't have resources to help them cope with distance learning. Um, so I, I have grave concerns about next year that go far beyond the budget. Okay, Member Levy, you have your hand up next. Thanks. Um, I appreciate what you just said, Superintendent Provost, and I, I recognize that that probably feels very daunting to start at that point. And I wonder if that's potentially the, the way forward. Um, I, I wanna echo, I think I, what you're saying and also what member Voss was saying and also what member Serfi Cox was saying, 
Um, I'm really concerned about what I've been hearing, especially coming out of Leeds, especially coming out of that second grade in Leeds. And I get that maybe the numbers themselves sound very similar to some of the other numbers at other schools in our district, but it's not just about numbers, it's about those students who are in those classes and the needs that those students are presenting with. And it sounds like there are very strong needs and great needs there, frankly pushing some people out of our district because they feel like their kids really aren't being served. And so if we're moving those students into third grade just in the same scenario that they're in now, I really am concerned about that. And so my hope is that we can I, I think do what you proposed, which is to say, how do we first meet those needs that our students are gonna be presenting and then, and then add in what else we can add in. And so to me, that would mean including that additional teacher at Leeds and also not losing our special education teachers. And so my hope would be that whatever our budget looks like, even if there are cuts in other areas, that we, that we would maintain those special education teachers and we would add that additional teacher at Leeds. Okay, um, Member Condon, you have your hand up next. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Provost and Kami, I, I wanna first off thank both of you for, for the work that you did to put this together. I know it got to all of us very late for this meeting this afternoon, um, but I know all that you have on your plate, so thank you. Um, speaking as uh, a, a teacher in another district that's gone through budget issues, uh, as a teacher who's gotten a pink slip myself, um, I know how hard it is to cut teacher positions. And, and I don't believe that, that either of you, as Dr. Provo said, are, are looking forward to it or, or it's something that you really want to do. Um, so I guess to, to the other uh, committee members, um, if keeping these special ed teachers and the, the other teacher positions that are getting cut, if, if keeping them is important to us, um, where else do you see making up the $250,000 that those positions represent? And I guess that's a question I pose to the, to the committee who has had a chance to look at the budget a, a bit. Okay, member Serafi Cox, you have your name up, your hand up. Uh, yeah, it, mine is actually a bit of a technical question, but related to this conversation, because uh, it sounds like, I mean, starting a budget from scratch would absolutely be a lot of work. And, uh, and on top of the buckets of work that you all are already doing. Um, and so I'm curious if there has been any indication from the state of extending or relaxing any of the deadlines for, uh, for passing budgets, or if we are still under the same timeline that we previously were? I can, um, I can address that. The, the only folks who are being granted relief under a bill filed by the governor are regional school districts. Um, they so far have been, and because regional school districts primarily rely on town meetings, um, and town meetings can't happen and are being delayed. So, um, so all other um, budgets at this point, we have to we have to have a budget in place, uh, city budget in place by June thirtieth. And there's no mechanism for uh, relaxing the timelines that we have within our charter. Um, the, none of the governor's legislation to date has addressed any of that. So, um, so we're still working. My finance director is continuing to work on uh, the city budget with city departments, and um, and so we need to stay on those targets um, unless something changes. The superintendent, does that square with your understanding? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Did you have another question, Member Serafi Cox? Uh, no, that answered it. Uh, it just makes me glad that we uh, planned that additional potential date on our calendars. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that's 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 good planning. Um, Member Kaufman, you have your hand up next. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so I see Superintendent Provo. So is my understanding is that the the two and a half um, reduction FTE reduction of special ed teachers continues, right? That's our recommendation. Yeah. So this would be the second time that principals had an opportunity, I guess, to change that, and they still are in, um, are in favor of it. So I would, I, I really think it would be helpful to get their feedback on why they think that this would not, um, why they think this would be okay moving forward. So if they can either appear at our next meeting, or if that's too long and they're too busy, maybe they can just write something quickly, each of the principals that's involved with this, explaining why they feel like this would not hurt their buildings and their students. Uh, Cause I feel like there's gotta be another side to the story. It, it's a concern that several of us have raised and um, I think their voice would be pretty critical moving forward to find out where uh, where they're coming from and, and maybe the folks that in uh, Dr. Plummer maybe as well if she has some insights. Dr. Provost is that is that yes we can that's... we can definitely get principals to appear at the next meeting. I think that it, it would be better to have them appear rather than just submit something in writing so that they could participate in the conversation and I would say just the the way I think they would conceptualize it is not yeah. that this is something that won't hurt their school. It's when going back to member Condon's question, if we talk about there's this amount of money we need to come up with and every school needs to contribute to it, this is where they think they can most easily take, make, make a contribution. In other words, the other things that, that could be cut would have more of an impact than this. Not that this won't have any impact. Okay, Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Okay, thanks. So yeah, um, to come back to Member Condon and other comments that have been made, and I really do appreciate Dr. Provost and Cami and your team that you probably have, you, I think you said you had two hours to think this through and this is where it's at. And I completely understand that. Um, I think what I'm hearing is let's keep thinking about it though. and realizing that it's school is going to look really different next year for all these reasons we've said especially where the kids are coming in and those that haven't been able to take advantage of online resources as much as others are going to need extra teachers to get them up to speed so i just will echo what we're saying i don't know exactly where these cuts should come and i think that was member condon's point but um many of us probably read the budget book and kind of realized this reality as we were reading, that's what happened to me over the last few days. And I might look at it with a different lens on in terms of what could we do without for a year or two. To the mayor's point, it's really hard to hire and then um, to have people depart because of the unemployment tax. So are there places in there that we could do They're not things you'd wanna cut forever, but what can we do? Are there people retiring? what could we do to make sure our classrooms have the staffing in the classrooms that are going to best serve the students next year and i also coming back to this question about school choice um it's a bigger conversation but i wonder if we get five thousand dollars per student i have this sense that maybe we're better off keeping our classes smaller next year because $5,000 per student isn't very much if you need to hire an ESP or a different adult in the classroom if there isn't enough support. So it's just another thought. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Member Busansky, you have your hand up next. Um, you, you have to unmute Member yeah. Busansky. Sorry, okay. got no it. Problem. Um, just a couple questions. So, I mean, first, you know, I echo everybody's thanks for all the work you've done on this and just in general in these last couple of weeks to get us through this, these really challenging and unprecedented times. But, um, so I'm just curious if we, I, I, I completely agree with the taking a more conservative budget approach. 
if we want to build something back in at a later time because uh, we find ourselves that we're able to do that in some way, do we have to, is there any interplay with the city at all? Do we have to go back? Um, do we have to request more money from the city? What's, what's kind of the process for that? Or is there just... So the, um, th there, if, an, if an additional appropriation, if we were at a place where we could make additional appropriations, then an additional appropriation would be made um, to the schools. So that's how the process would work. I mean, similar to what happened in 2013, we actually passed a budget um, before an override, then the and had to adopt the budget just because of the timing, then the override passed, and then we ended up appropriating additional money back to the school. So, I mean, and we, you know, occasionally we appropriate more money. So that would be how the process would work. That's, of course, assuming we have money to appropriate. Of course. That, you know, if we're in that position. But yes, that, that certainly can happen. Um, Got it. It's much easier than the alternative, the whole cut scenario. And, and um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then also, I'm just wondering with the uh, two and a half um, SPED teachers you're proposing cutting, what's the associated unemployment costs with that? And, and where do we see that anywhere in the budget? We don't anticipate that there'll be any unemployment cost with that. Every summer we turn over between 30 and, and 100 positions within the district, including all units and SPED. Special education teachers uh, have a broad range of grade levels that they can serve. So we think that the te special ed teachers who would be reduced would fill other vacancies that will occur within the district. So there wouldn't they wouldn't be um, laid off, and there wouldn't be any unemployment costs. Got it. Thank you. And then I'm also, I mean, I agree with, I appreciate what member Kaufman said that we, and I completely understand why, you know, we came to us so late and I just haven't had a chance to really look through and fully process it. So I'm also very thankful that we have another meeting. Um, and I really would appreciate hearing from the elementary school principals as well, because I think this, this bed teachers is a really, um, hard one for me to wrap my head around and also losing out on that additional leads teacher and ESPs, even though I realize this is not what any, this is not the picture any of us wants to paint. I know that. Um, but I am kind of curious about um, building based budget increases and why those are remaining in there. If you might be able to speak to that, um, superintendent. Superintendent. Did you hear the question, Superintendent Provost? Hmm. Let's see. There. Yep. Sorry, I had to step out for a second, but nope, I heard the no question. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was around building-based budget. Um, so that is something that we discussed with the principals, and actually it was an area that we had highlighted as a potential reduction because it was one that we could make without um, any personnel cost, really. Um, they are very concerned about reducing it because of the increasing cost of their copying. Um, they, they basically say that every amount we're able to give them in increased building-based budgets on a yearly basis gets consumed by their copying costs. Wow, and so, uh, but this is, we're talking about an increase, right? Not just keeping it status quo, but they're saying they need that additional increase? That's right, in fact, for copying. they said, Right, they said that they feel that it's somewhat um, misleading to describe it as an increase because it all goes to the copier. Got it, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Member Busansky. Member Gold, you have your hand up next. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, about in this discussion about the two and a half uh, special education teachers, um, you know, I appreciated the way Member Condon asked, like, what would we like as an alternative because, um, or what do we see would be an alternative? Because it sounds like, if I'm not mistaken, somewhat straightforward that one of the positions isn't actually being used and the other one is increasing the ratio from one to four to one to eight. And I guess the big thing would be to understand what that, you know, four new students could have a huge impact, you know, but it also might not. So I think that's where hearing it 
you know, from the teachers would be helpful. Um, something to think about is just looking at some of the feedback we did get from the staff and um, at some of the schools that were seeing those cuts, there was a uh, feedback about, you know, this would hurt unless we look at how we're, um, you know, identifying students and maybe we're over identifying. And so maybe that would push us to reconsider how students are being identified and whether we are doing that. And maybe that's where the savings comes in. Um, and then the, I guess, so the last thing to just add is knowing how um, stressed out everyone is through this whole situation. I would not want us to, I would, I would caution us in giving the district more work on developing other plans if the obvious choice is still gonna be there, if you know what I mean. Like I wouldn't want to dedicate too much time of the district in coming up with alternative plans if, if, if it's unnecessary because the obvious choice is right there. And I'm not saying like we vote on anything tonight. I like that we have another meeting, but um, I just don't want for, yeah, I don't want too much work being put, extra work being put on for the sake of just knowing that the right choice was the right choice. Sorry, John Provost, did you want to respond directly to that? I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, okay. The, the situation at Jackson Street that I was describing is not, a, is not a teacher who's not working with any students. It's a special ed teacher who's not working with any special education students. Um, I don't want the public to think that we have teachers who are um, not doing anything. But when you, you think about how many special education teachers are needed in a school, you really need to look at how many special education students there are in the school and, and how that caseload is being divided because the special ed teachers are really there for the special ed students. So I just wanted to clarify that there will be, you know, some impact in that the individual would no longer be working with, there to work with non-special ed students, but it wouldn't have it in, impact on the special ed caseload. So I just wanted to clarify that piece. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Serafie Cox, you had your hand up next. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, we do have one additional meeting scheduled on April 9th. I'll, uh, the additional meeting I was talking about was the holds that we put on our calendars for uh, Monday, April 13th, um, so that we had planned for the possibility of having two additional meetings. I do know that for uh, district staff, attending these meetings uh, during this time of crisis is a, a burden. So I want to recognize that, but I just wanted to uh, remind us all that we had planned for a potential additional meeting on the 13th. Um, uh, another uh, kind of point of information, uh, Member Condon had said um, the uh, 2.5 SPED teachers uh, would have a cost, uh, if we were to add them back in, would have a cost of 250000 um, And I looked uh, it, at what we were given at the last meeting, it looks like the cost was 136000 not 250000 that, if I could, that comment, uh, that was all of the positions cut. There was like a 0.3 like enrichment teacher, like a 0.5 librarian. So all of the position, position cuts added to 250,000. I see. Okay. Yes, I, I, um, I, I don't know as much about those other positions and I haven't heard as much from constituents about those. So what I have been talking about is the 2.5 uh, special education teachers. Um, then a question for the mayor, uh, further clarification about if we were to uh, do an additional appropriation after the budget is passed. My assumption is that that would then be a decision uh, by the city council, whether or not to grant an additional appropriation to the school, dis uh, school department, is that correct? Yeah, the mayor, the mayor proposes all budgetary matters and all appropriations, and then it would be subject to city council approval, mm -hmm. just like the budget, just like the budget process is subject to city council approval. That's and, correct. Okay. Um, and so I guess my question is really in terms of process, would it be then something that 
the school committee would need to formally ask in like a formal vote to ask the city to do that at a later date or I mean well, I know this is all hypothetical but I mean what the school committee would do is when the dust settles and we see where things shake out and we've sort of taken this conservative stance if it turns out that there is additional flexibility with revenues and with state aid and with other numbers then I think that's that would be the time that we would um, go back and revisit mm -hmm. uh, these this more conservative approach we took and see are there things we could now add back in you know you, you know again I I can't say what that will look like or what those numbers will look like I can't say it's going to be the 5.4 percent we were talking about two months ago um, but if it's some additional funding then that that we have that discussion and if we agreed then that would be something that i would need to recommend um uh, you know again i would be honest with you about whether we have the ability to do that um and we'll maybe have a clearer picture depending on where we're sitting at that time with all the other factors of state aid and federal aid um i mean we haven't even talked about federal aid as a part of this collapse as well i don't even know how that's going to play into this but um, but so yeah, that's how the process would work. Okay, very good. Um, and then my last uh, point, uh, last question is, um, I was confused by something that member Gold said, um, something about over identification of special education students. And I'm wondering if uh, member Gold could clarify his comment. Um, sure, yeah, one of the, in the feedback form um, that teachers um, uh, teachers filled out, one of the Bridge Street teachers, or one of the teachers shared, or I'm not sure if it was Bridge Street, um, that uh, right now we're over determining special edu el eligibility. And so we can barely meet the IEP needs. And so, I mean, just the reality of sometimes in schools that um, kids are getting over identified by a team, um, for a variety of reasons, because um, it's a team decision um, that sometimes happens where um, there's other options, um, other accommodations and modifications be that classroom teachers can do or schools can do before the student actually goes into the IEP process. And sometimes, you know, I've seen it myself, that reality where sometimes, you know, kids for a variety of reasons are getting identified that really shouldn't have been. And so um, I was just sharing that point that a, that a Northampton teacher shared in the feedback. Okay, um, Dr. Provost, did you wanna say anything about that? Uh, I, I actually wanted to go back um, just to, to answer a question that was raised earlier. And also I think it's germane to the point that member Seraphy Cox was just making, which is as a practical matter, there is one body that gets an exception to the deadlines and that's the state legislature. And I think in all likelihood, we're going to have to pass our budget before the state passes its budget. And so one of the, one of the things that's going to be pressing on us is if we don't have a budget, everything comes to a stop on July 1st. So we're going to have to move forward without in all likelihood without having the information that we would like to have in terms of how much state aid is coming and possibly even how much federal aid is coming. So that's the school committee, I think is just at a tremendous informational disequilibrium. And, and whenever, whenever times are financially tough, that, that's, that's the disadvantage school committees are at, I think. Okay. Um... And the I, the question that, or the comment about over identification is that anything you wanted to respond to or? Sure, I, I don't know what the um, I don't actually know specifically what what the teacher was referring to, but over identification is an issue that we've been um, dealing with throughout my time here. Um, I we have reduced the rate. Um, in Northampton from somewhere around 25% to somewhere just over 20%. Um, the statewide average is closer to 18%. So there um, is still some area to go and there's variations between schools. 
um, having having stronger first primary and secondary interventions in place is the way we've been focused on focusing on trying to reduce over identification. But I do have a big issue about or a big concern about what's happening right now, and I think that it it is possibly um, planting the seeds for us to lose all the progress we've made on that because. The way students are identified is through standardized testing that um, compares their developmental level to other students who've had the same age and presumed same level of education. And right now, every student in the country is being denied the, the typical type of developmental experiences that would allow them to grow. So I think that students who otherwise would be able to stay within normal limits are likely to show up as, as being um, being underperforming for their age or grade level, which could reduce or could result in our re-blossoming of special education identification rates. Okay. So um, there are no other hands raised right now. Um, oh, Member Voss, your hand is raised, sorry. Sorry, ahead, I, I've no problem. Waiting for other people to have a chance, but I had, I guess, I had two questions. One is what maybe the mayor or Dr. Provost could clarify for us in this budget process. Ultimately, we have to vote on an amount and just help us understand what that means and what it looks like if that gets changed after we vote on it. And then my second question is. Schools are closed for a sustained amount of time. Um, are we saving any money on that? We're not paying utility <clears throat> bills, probably. I don't have a good sense of, you know, we're not, there's certain things we're not paying, but I'm sure there's certain things that are costing more. Um, and if we are saving money, can that get transferred or can it get used in some creative way to support these kids that we're talking about that we're worried about? Um, Superintendent Provost, I mean, I can tell you, I think we've talked about that the vast majority of our budget is salary and benefits. So you already start with, you know, 90 plus percent. Um, and obviously we're maintaining that for all of our employees. Um, our buildings are still being utilized in terms of food service uh, programming. Um, I don't know if all the buildings are um, being fully utilized. Obviously, some aspects of the buildings are being shut down. Um, I don't believe that, I don't know that we'll be seeing significant savings in that regard, um, especially as we come out of heating season. Uh, we won't be heating the buildings uh, much longer. Um, so I, I don't I don't know what that could be. I could think about it. Um, uh, I, I don't really know offhand what immediate savings would be. Can yes, I Member Ross. Yes. So, yeah, I totally appreciate that. I don't think it's going to be a huge windfall of money. But for example, if we get to May and it's clear or end sometime in May, there's been no spring sports at the high school. Um, there's probably some money saved there. And I guess it's more of a question if there are little, even little bits of savings, what happens to that money when, money when July 1st hits? Dr. Provost. So with respect to the personnel costs, really our costs have only increased during this period because everyone is still making their regular wages and anyone who's coming in to work for us is now making bonus pay. So we're actually, we're actually experiencing um, a higher than anticipated personnel cost at this time. The, Probably biggest potential area of savings will come down to what happens with transportation contracts, which is the next thing on the agenda tonight. Um, in terms of uh, carrying money over from year to year, there's really no way to do that. I mean, the only funds that are able to survive from year to year are revolving accounts. Athletics does have a revolving account, so there would be less expenditure from the revolving account because the revolving account goes to um, support some of the spring sports, so there wouldn't be that cost there. Um, but if we had, say, 
a million dollars of extra money at the end of the year, most of that would revert to the general account. And you also have, you would you may be able to diminish the amount that you'd need to use from school choice potentially, which is something that also may occur, correct, Dr. Provost? Right. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Because a certain amount of the budget is built on school choice. The only thing I would caution about the spring sports is that if you if you divert those monies from sports to some other operation, then you're going to have to find a way to make up for that immediately in the previous in the next budget year. If you try to build a budget using essentially using monies for something totally different, then you're that'll be the challenge with that as well. But I think, but I superintendent's pointer is right about the I was, yeah, uh, the the personnel costs are in a different environment right now. So I'll be surprised if we do see major savings at the end of the year. Did that answer your question for now, at least? And we can do further study. Yeah. Remember, no. boss? Thank you. And it's basically what I expected. I just wanted to hear what you all okay. have to say and about carrying over. Um, but my other question was, um, can you just help everybody understand we when we do vote on this budget, we're I, my understanding is we're going to vote on an amount that's recommended to us, and we have an idea of how it's being spent. But what is what exactly are we voting on, and then what is the process for changing it as things change? So you're right. You you vote an amount, and um, you're you're voting the whole budget book. So you're basically talking about how the funds are allocated as well. By our policies. Um, transfers over a certain amount require school committee approval. So if there are transfers within the way we envision spending the money that, that is represented by that amount you vote for, then the school committee would have to approve those transfers. The one exception to that is at the end of the year when the school committee votes to give the superintendent authority to do unilateral transfers to, to close the books at the end of June. Okay, um, Member Fallon, you have your hand up. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to weigh in before we um, close this part of the discussion and um, thank you, Mayor and Dr. Provost for your really extraordinary leadership throughout all of this. Um, and Tammy and Annie for all the extra work I know they've been doing. Um, I was very concerned with the information coming out um, by the Massachusetts Taxpayers Found Benchmarks warning um, about the uh, pretty much inevitable recession that we'll be experiencing. And um, so I was really glad that you're presenting um, a kind of an austerity budget. I would love to keep as much flexibility as possible um, as to how we do address um, the needs that we'll be experiencing because I am concerned about our incoming kindergarten class. I think that we all know how important um, early childhood education is, and I'm wondering um, what effect a prolonged school closure is going to have on students um, as far as kindergarten readiness and the amount of extra support those students that we don't even have in the buildings yet are going to need. Um, so I appreciate the budget, and I, as while well, it's not ideal, um, I understand it and I, I do support it as long as we maintain flexibility to address the needs as uh, we become aware of them. So thank you. You're muted. Sorry. Member Levy, you have your hand up. Sorry. Thanks. My question, and I don't 100% know how to phrase this uh, in the most diplomatic way, but my question is um, what the process would be if, as a school committee, we determined that we wanted to ask basically the city for a slightly larger percentage I completely understand the, the times and the, the challenges that our city is going to be facing. Um, but if we decide in order to meet the needs of our students, the amount that we need is slightly higher than what the bottom line is currently in this proposed budget, what's the process to say to the city, are there, is, is the like, is there a possibility for that, that funding to come from the city? and out of another chunk of the city budget? Well, um, 
what I can tell you is the budget that was proposed is the largest increase of any of the city budgets. Um, you know, the percentage, the 5.4% increase in the MPS budget will be larger than the overall budget increase for the whole general fund budget. Um, so that's already happening or was already about to happen in the current environment. So um, in terms of, uh, the, I mean, the, the process is that the, the school budget is part of the overall uh, general fund budget. And so request, uh, certainly the request can be made from the school committee and I can, uh, and you know, we can talk that through, um, but there has to be an ability to pay for it. Um, and so um, again, uh, you know, none of our city departments, we are not increasing any personnel in any of our city departments. So we're not adding any, you know, public safety or uh, you know, police or fire or anything like that in, in that's been our current thinking. Um, so that would involve, um, a decision about whether there were going to be cuts made in public safety. I don't know that we'd be making cuts in public safety at this time. Um, we're worried about retaining the staff we have now and keeping them healthy. So I, I don't really know what that conversation would look like. Um, but, um, you know, everything would be on the table, but I, but I, I really can't give you a definitive answer on that other than it has to go through the budgetary process and that the, you know, the school budget, which is already, you know, 55 plus percent of all city spending um, would be there as part of all the other competing interests that we, we would have to figure out a way to fund. So that's really the process. I'm Thanks. sorry, that's not really a great answer, but that's sort of just the best I can give you. Um, but I can say that the budget that we, we started with was going to be the largest single percentage increase of you know any of the budgets across the city and larger probably than the overall increase of the general fund budget itself. So we were at that starting point. So to the extent we can maintain some semblance of that, we'll try, but we, we obviously can't do it without resources. Sure, thanks. Yeah. The next person is Superintendent Provost. So I just wanted to say with, for, the public and also for the committee to know about the process here. This was a group of administrators relying on their their experience trying to, to figure out what would be possible and what might be reasonable in the environment we're heading into. But you all saw the budget the same time the mayor did. This is not a process of trying to cut down to a figure and I came into this meeting not even knowing if this number was realistic. So. Um, there was a kind of administrative purity to this process, if you will, that I just wanted you to know. Kimmy, you had your hand up next. So I, I did want to just echo on, on that a little bit, um, only because I've I've gone through it a couple times before where there's been a a bit of a lag time after an incident happened that then affected the economy. Um, this one I see impacting it sooner than the last two. Uh, the first one was after 9-11 and the impact didn't come for until the next year. Um, and in 2008, it was the economy. So it generally started slowing down. Um, so this is a little bit different where it's almost gonna have an instant impact within the next few months. Um, I, I really just want to caution the committee, and that's where I am on the more conservative side because I have lived it, um, unfortunately. Um, when we were looking at the numbers with the administrative team, we're going to have to see where the city comes and what they can afford is absolutely correct, but it's also one of those things that when I looked at the 3.65 in my heart, in my experience, I had the feeling that that might not be low enough. And I just wanted to all have you hear that from me that I don't want there to be any surprises later that if that's what happens. And I think the worst thing, and I've said it to the administrators today, I think the worst thing is to go in with a higher number and then have the state make what they call 9C cuts and the governor has to slash their budget from what they proposed in July and all of a sudden in December or January, they make mid-year 9C cuts. We have to make double 
the cuts to get down to a number. That's painful, and I've had to do that before. Um, so I, I, I do caution, try to figure out what it is, but even when I look at a 3.65% increase, that's a healthy increase. So I just wanted to share that piece of what I've seen and in, in where we are right now at the moment. Member Seraphie Cox, you have your hand up next. Yeah, I was just, um, um, I guess where I'm at is that I would like to continue this conversation. I know on our agenda, it says possible vote. I would definitely say that I don't think we should vote tonight. Um, and I would, I know that over the course of uh, the next couple of weeks before our next meeting, um, that there will be further information and uh, that uh, Ms. Lamka and Superintendent Provost will be continuing to work hard on this. So I, um, I guess I'm just feeling like maybe the conversation um, has run its course at this time, although I see that there are other hands up. Okay, um, thank you. Member Gold, did you want to add anything more before we? Well, yeah, if it's all right, I just wanted to follow up with what Ms. Lemick was saying, because that's sort of what I was trying to get at before that. I mean, three point, the fact that we're still doing an increase seems like, and I guess it, the play by play sounds like the school year won't start when we would have to cut again, because I just wouldn't, I feel like it's very destabilizing the schools to start with staffing, thinking they have that, and all of a sudden the cuts coming in September or October because we overshot what we thought we could actually afford. So, I mean, if I guess there's, if the 3.625 is, is a risky increase, I mean, I would just ask that we consider the scenario of it not even being 3.625, you know what I mean? And maybe going lower just so we don't have that destabilization at the beginning of the school year or whenever it comes that, that can really have a bigger impact than if you didn't have that staffing already because I definitely know that you could design things in a school with what you have but it's you know and that's working well but as soon as you pull a piece out it kind of can really make the whole tower fall if you know what I mean so um, that, that, that's what I meant earlier and I'd love any info on that to know when that would happen in fact I heard you say the month but I wasn't exactly sure the like, timeline thank you um as I said, we're we're all kind of um, we're all trying to process this without a lot of information. There's we don't have a lot of the information that we need from the state level, so it's going to really be literally a day to day, week to week process moving forward. We may know more by the time we meet again in April. Um, I don't know. Uh, we're still waiting to see what is going to come out of uh, Beacon Hill in terms of their ability to meet and put together some kind of a budget proposal. So um, we're just gonna try to provide as much information as we have available and make the best guesstimates we can using obviously conservative numbers. And that's the best we can do at this point. So member Seraphie Cox um, indicated that she, she felt that we have had an opportunity to discuss this now revised uh, proposal um, knowing that we've asked several questions, we've asked for some clarifications, we've asked for some information to be provided in, in similar format to the prior budget book. And do we feel comfortable moving on to the uh, next item on the agenda? I don't, any other hands raised that wanna make any additional points? Okay, um, so let's move on then to uh, the discussion and possible vote. Uh, this is on authorizing the superintendent uh, to negotiate a transportation contract adjustment for services not rendered during the statewide uh, shutdown. Um, and I would turn this over to, um, to the superintendent or Ms. Lamica and or Ms. Lamica. So, if I could have the committee's indulgence, I've been in back-to-back -back meetings since 1.30 this afternoon. I really need a stretch break. Could I just step out for a second? I'll, I'll send you a, a uh, message when I get back, if that's okay. Okay.
Okay, so we're just taking a slight pause in our proceedings. Are you able to discuss that? Um, so I will be, I am able to. Um, Dr. Provost was actually going to present some background information on policy ACE, but I, I feel comfortable beginning the presentation. Um, you all should have received policy um, ACE, uh, which is non discrimination on the basis of disability. Um, I think the superintendent may be back. Superintendent, are you back? I'm back. Okay. So we were just about to move on to the, um, I think we were just about to move on to ACE thinking we could buy a little time, but why don't we just stick with the agenda if that's okay, member Fallon, and then we'll just that's follow you. Absolutely order. fine. Okay. So we'll, we're at number, um, at item B, uh, and we were introducing the authorization to have you negotiate a tr transportation contract adjustment. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Superintendent Provost. Yeah, so I have written to the school committee about this, so you're aware of some of the issues. So <laughs> my, my comments will be mainly for the public. Um, I, as I do with our own employees, I believe in trying to support our transportation companies to make payroll for their employees. I want everyone to be paid throughout this, this economic crisis we're going through. However, I, given the conversation that we just had, I don't think that we should be bearing the full brunt of the cost of our transportation vendors maintaining operations because they are eligible for, well, are soon to be eligible for federal um, support, likely to be eligible for state support, and also are responsible for their own operations. It's hard for me to say that I'm a good steward of public resources if I'm um, if I'm going too far to support a vendor for providing um, services that are not being rendered to the school, even though it's not their fault. I would also add there's somewhat of a uh, legal question as to whether we can even pay the vendors anything um, at this time because they're not rendering services and that, that um, does not seem to comport with the current municipal finance regulations, although there, I don't know if there'll be any changes to that in this um, emergency time. However, I uh, do agree with the comment that the first um, public commenter made. Our bus drivers um, provide a valuable service for us, and I'd like to find a way to work with the vendor around that and would also like some direction from the school committee about whether they feel that um, even though the district isn't receiving services, if we could try to renegotiate in a way that would at least allow the, our vendors to be able to help make, make payroll for their employees, which I think is the right thing to do. And I also think is the practical thing to do because at some point schools will reopen and we will want um, drivers to be ready to drive the buses. Okay. Um... So essentially, this is um, just for by way of background. These contracts do have the ability to um, for, for there to be a renegotiation um, as part of as, as part of the contract. So you're essentially asking the school committee to authorize you uh, to be able to negotiate with our provider um, in in terms of what we're being asked to pay overall for services during this shutdown. That's correct. And also to, to give some sense of direction for what you think the um, the boundaries are that the, the committee might be able to support. Member Kaufman. 
Member yeah, Kaufman. Thank you. Yep. Um, question, uh, Superintendent Provost, is this something that's specific only to Durham or do we have um, contracts with other vendors that would be similar to this? I was thinking, for example, do we have like food vendors that are paying folks to produce food and deliver food to us that we that we've been using? Is it is that a similar analogy, or are there any other um, vendors that might fall into this? The other vendor who uh, would fall into this is Vanpool, and I believe that we've already sent a similar um, letter to them saying that we're interested in renegotiating during the shutdown. So was our discussion for both Durham and Vanpool? I actually don't have the agenda um, in front of me, so I can't exactly see how it's posted. Okay, but is it maybe then where are we talking in general? Because is there like, are, are there, are you sure there's nobody else that would fall into this? Well, there are a number of vendors, but I can't, and I'll, I'll defer to Cami on this, but I can't think of vendors that are providing services on a daily basis in the same way that um, our transportation vendors are. A lot of our other vendors are um, people who we call in to work on heating and, and ventilation or other things that have to do with the mechanical aspects of the schools. But, um, and they could still do that or they could do that on a delayed basis. The thing that's unique about these vendors is they can only provide services when school is in session and right now school is not in session. Well, actually, there is one other class of vendor who falls with in this, but um, they are already um, they're already sort of covered, it, and that's our private special education schools because their um, the regulations there say that they bill for services rendered. Um, that will become a question because some of them are um, starting to to discuss the possibility of providing virtual services, and that. Um, that raises a, a lot of questions for us. Um, part of part of the reason that students require specialized programming and out of district placements is because they need the place. They they need um, the therapeutic milieu, and it's hard to know how you do that virtually. But so that might be a, a another um, another bridge we need to cross. But right now, I think the two that that are foremost in our minds are Vanpool and Durham. Okay, and you said you already had some outreach to Vanpool about this, or was that similar outreach that you did to Durham? The letter that you that you shared with us. I I believe it was just a similar letter to the one that we sent to Durham. Okay, I think there also may have been some direct communication, as there was direct verbal communication with Durham as well. All right. So if um, do you have any do you have any knowledge? of whether it would be feasible for us to uh, reimburse or work out an agreement with Durham that the money that we would provide to them would just go to their bus drivers? Is that something that you're thinking about or, or have you looked into that already? Like, is it, is it even feasible that it wouldn't go to their overall operating expenses or other, other finances that they are needing to, um, be, to obligate at this point? So at this point, I'd like to bring Cami into the conversation if, if um, through the chair, if that's okay, because we have thought of some potential um, concepts to put on the table. You know, obviously money is fungible. So once it's paid, it's very difficult to control where it goes, but there may be some ways of structuring an agreement that would um, make us feel like we're assisting with the payroll component, but not being um, dragged into um, the other parts of the operation that probably should be the vendor's responsibility. So if I can just add a couple pieces, um, this is a conversation that's going on throughout the state with all the business managers. Um, we're trying to take a look at um, what is a reasonable percentage to pay um, the vendors that aren't operating, but they have costs. Part of it is um, their personnel costs, but a lot of it is their overhead, meaning the lease payments on those vehicles. Um, what we're concerned about throughout the, the business world is these are businesses that are hard to come by as it is. The drivers are hard to come by as it is. If they lose the drivers or if these businesses don't make it and they go bankrupt, you're not gonna have anybody to replace them as our, all of our concerns. So we're trying to make sure we're helping to maintain that service is there when we call up the phone and the governor says we can open again, that we'll be able to. So 
we talked about it on the state level of trying to come up with what is a reasonable amount of money because every vendor is throwing out to every business person what amount of money they would like to have, <laughs> um, obviously. So we're talking about that. Um, some of the things that I discussed with John that would be important because the drivers in the private sector can be placed on unemployment and they'll get an unemployment check, but that's realistically probably about 60% of what their salary is. And one thing that we're trying to do if we do this is also to help the state at the same time so the unemployment pool doesn't drastically become very large for managed because then it takes away from state dollars that otherwise we could get um, in our funding. So some of the things that we've talked about would be important for us to have in there would be obviously a percentage of our costs, um, what it would normally be to run a route. Um, and, and only a percentage of that, we have to determine what that percentage is. Um, we wanna be able to say when the governor says we can reopen again, that within a very short period of time, meaning a day or two, that they're gonna be up and running and tell us, yes, we're ready to go. We can do that for you. Um, some of the things that we looked at it is, maybe that's one of the stipulations we try to negotiate is that we agree to do this as long as you pay your drivers their regular wages and you don't place them on unemployment. And if there's any state or federal assistance that they're able to receive, that they apply for it and that we would receive the money back because we have now paid them fully for their costs. Not fully, but a good piece of what it normally would keep it going to keep their business operational. And many of the business managers have looked at it that we're not necessarily paying for a service while we're closed. We're paying an insurance policy that they'll be there when we need them again on the next day. Interesting. Is this, is, is my last question, but is, is this the same Durham that's the multi-billion dollar conglomerate that basically works in every state across the country? It is, it's a portion of it. They yeah. do it by region. Right, it just feels like, um, I, I, yeah, it just feels odd to me. I, I understand my focus would be paying our local bus drivers to help the larger Durham survive, especially when there's, I think, $500 million to help companies that size. That just seems like that's just such a big picture. I can't wrap my mind around it. But if there's something we can do, I do like your thinking in terms of, you know, protecting that the money that's going to go to them theoretically would help our bus drivers, and that if unemployment, which uh, I understand could be vast amount of more money than it used to be for an extended period of time, um, you know, we don't want to pay them and then have them not access or I don't know, it gets complicated, but I do appreciate your thinking that we want to do good. Well, I, I agree with you, we want to do good by our local folks. The bigger picture of saving Durham to me seems a little, um, oh God, it seems like they're, they're so big, they should be taking care of their employees and I hope they are. But I can certainly I can certainly support the idea of paying our local bus drivers. For me, that's the right way to move. I think what our, each one of the business managers that I've talked to, um, and we're all talking, we actually have a call with the state tomorrow and another call on Monday with the state yeah. um, that we can all have a chance to talk and bat around all these ideas and things that are going on. Um, and we've had a number of them with some issues that we had about other things, trying to get some guidance from them. Um, we, even First Student is an extremely large company, um, but First Student has 50,000 employees. So to maintain that payroll with no revenue coming in is the reality of what they're facing. So they have no choice but to lay them off, but they worry about the same thing. It's the training. Are they going to come back? Are they going to find a job someplace else and not come back and not be able to replace them? So in two days, when we call up and say we need the buses, are they going to say we're short for bus drivers now? And some of the companies are smaller companies. And depending on the banks and the lease payments that they've got, if they can't make those payments, what's going to happen with the banks? Are they going to go after them and they won't stay in existence? Um, a lot of the companies had expressed um, to a number of business managers that in between the athletic 
trips that they make um, throughout the seasons. In addition to, we were just normally coming up in the spring as a lot of field trip season. So what they call the charter routes, um, that's where they make a lot of the profit piece of that. And now there will be none of it because we're not running at all. So those Thanks. are some of the other pieces they've shared with us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Cami. Member Fallon, you had your hand up next. Um, yes, yeah, so I I do entirely support um, what you're saying, um, Cami and Dr. Provost. Um, I think that it's so important that we um, do our best to try and um, make sure that those drivers um, are in fact able to, to come right back to work. I think that there's a, you know how difficult it is for us to find drivers and I would hate to lose them because they're now being offered a position in another bus company um, when it finally um, does come time to go back to work. I know other districts, including Holyoke and Worcester have negotiated um, uh, smaller payments. They're not paying in full, but they are paying a portion or percentage um, of what they had initially pledged. And so I think that it's absolutely logical and the right thing to do to um, allow um, Dr. Provost to negotiate a transportation contract adjustment for the services um, that haven't been rendered since we shut down. And I actually would like to make that motion um, if that's possible right now. Would you be willing to second that motion, Member Serafi Cox, for purposes of discussion? Uh, for purposes of discussion, sure. Okay, just because the motion was made and um, you had your hand up next. So um, so there was a motion made and seconded. Um, and Member Serafi Cox, you had your hand up next. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my question that I had before has been answered uh, and I'll just state it to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly, that we can, uh, um, it's not a matter of we're just not going to pay. It could be a matter of negotiating a smaller amount. Um, I also heard uh, in the discussion the possibility of having some stipulation that uh, that uh, our local bus drivers are not uh, laid off. Um, and and I uh, I think that that that's a great idea, a, a great protection for our bus drivers. I wonder about the the legality of it. So I would want us to make sure that, that that's, um, I don't know. I, I, I guess maybe legality is a bad, uh, I don't know that they would agree to that. <laughs> Although maybe they want the payment badly enough that they would agree to it. So, but I, I guess I would just say that I, I support that. Um, and I would like maybe some clarification about what the, uh, the motion is that I seconded. Um, is there, is there direction with that motion about what we want uh, the uh, uh, the district to to negotiate relative to this, or is it just we're saying yes to negotiation? Uh, Member Fallon, did you want to clarify what your motion was? Member Fallon. Sorry, uh, the motion was just as it appeared on the agenda to authorize the superintendent to negotiate a transportation contract adjustment for services not rendered during the statewide shutdown. I, I didn't set any parameters. I'm sure if that's important to the rest of the committee, we could. But during this time, I feel like giving him as much um, freedom to, to make decisions um, as possible when he's got so much else going on um, would be important. So I don't want to bind him too too closely um, when this decision needs to be made uh, fairly quickly. Um, Superintendent, do you have the, you, you're hearing this discussion though, so you certainly understand the what, what you're hearing the school committee's hoping to achieve and even what Ms. Lamica is saying that she hopes to try to achieve within the bounds of what's allowed. Yeah, so what, what I feel that I'm getting from the discussion is that the agreement that I'd bring back would need to have a protection for our local drivers, um, keeping them from being placed on unemployment, keeping them at their regular wages, um, and also trying to not go too much farther into the basic operational costs of the district, of, of, of the, the transportation vendor, and also making sure that they 
vigorously uh, pursue any state or federal relief that may be available to them so that they can maintain their operations with as little impact on district finances as possible. Okay. Does that address your question, Ms. Serafi Cox, or would you want all of that folded into the motion or? Um, I think as long as the superintendent has that understanding, um, I'm comfortable with it. Because he'll ultimately bring something back that we would have to approve, correct, superintendent? That's correct. Okay, so we'll Very have good. a final, final view of it. Uh, Member Voss, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I agree with what folks are saying, and I just have one other question. Are families going to ask for refunds for bus passes that weren't used, and how are we going to handle that if that happens? If I can answer that. Um, so we, Tammy Lieber and I had discussed it already, knowing that we had just received payments for the third trimester last week or the week before we closed. Um, it, it's really up to the committee if they wanted to refund, but the policy is that all the fees are non-refundable. Okay, did that answer your question, Member Voss? Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to bring it up as an elephant in the room we haven't talked about yet. Member Gold, you have your hand up next. Uh, yes, I was just going to ask, um, does it ever happen that, because as Ms. Lemke was saying, like with other business managers and other, are dealing with the same situation, like where we could join with other districts in making an agreement with um, Durham on this? And I, you know, just a thought out there. So I wanted to throw that out there because if Durham's dealing with a couple districts with this, it might be helpful. So, just so that's my call on Monday with the state. Gotcha. Member Busansky, you have your hand up next. Member Busansky. Um, I keep forgetting to unmute myself, sorry about that. Um, I just was wondering, Superintendent, about what you mentioned earlier about there might be a legal question about services not rendered and if you're gonna have to look into that before you start negotiations. And then also, um, uh, what if you really think it's really um, possible that we make an, come to an agreement and maybe Ms. Lamica, you could even speak to this, that we come to an agreement that says that they have to go out and get whatever kind of state and federal um, incentives are out there and that we would actually get money back. That just seems a little bit like a long shot. Beyond that, I really do, um, I, I agree that you should go and negotiate. Um, and I feel comfortable with that. But so, uh, so to provide a high level answer that I'm sure Ms. Lamica can expand upon, a bedrock principle of municipal finance in Massachusetts is that you cannot um, pay for services until they've been rendered or goods until they've been received. So in this case, we would be you know, intentionally agreeing to, to pay for services that we know we're not going to receive. And that's what raises the legal question. And how do you how do you go forward with that? How do you plan to proceed? So I know that the state is working on um, some flexibility around that because the state is also considering. So what happens if we have a law that essentially forces all of our transportation vendors to go bankrupt? Then how do we reopen school? Um, so I I know that. You know, that's been worked at more at the business manager level than at the superintendent level, but um, that is the barrier. And, you know, the non-official guidance we've received is uh, try, to, try to exercise as much flexibility as you can with the belief that the state is going to try to do something to make this work. And I think that's where it will be important to actually have the contract amendment because it's gonna say that we're paying for something different rather than we're gonna pay you X amount of dollars to run the bus at this cost for the day. We're gonna be saying we're paying you X amount of dollars to reserve the right to call you back kind of terminology rather than paying for 
that service. So in between that and working the state and the state person knows that this is the roadblock. So they're working with the Department of Revenue and the legislators that this is the roadblock. How do we mirror the two and, and figure out how to solve it for everybody? Member Seraphie Cox, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I like probably many others in our community have been buying gift cards from our local businesses and, uh, that we love so much in order to keep them afloat. I wonder if a potential contract could look something like that, that perhaps you are paying now for services that you expect to be rendered for next school year uh, and paying for it over a longer period of time to ensure the, the continuity of their um, business operations. Um. I'm not sure if superintendent or Kimmy want to respond to that. I, I So I I see Cammy writing. I you know, we're we're at the the phase right now of trying to explore different options. So um, I saw her write it down. Yeah. I, honestly, you know, we're in uncharted waters here. So hard yeah. for me to say what could be possible or what could be impossible at this time. I'm not taking anything off the table. No, and, and I'm not either. That's why I'm writing it down. So a lot of the business folks, we're, we're all talking, we're all bouncing a lot of ideas off each, off each other. So one of the things that I, I see with that piece is, because um, the first instant bus companies were asking is they believed or many of their contracts had a 180 day guarantee in their contract, no matter what. So when they bid a contract, they are bidding knowing that they're gonna get 180 days worth of business plus the athletics, plus the field trips. So that's how they calculate what they're gonna charge us and bid it for three years or five years. So that's what they're sort of up against with the gift card is if we think that they're gonna give us a credit for next year, they're counting on another 180 days next year to get revenue in. So that's where that might become difficult, but hey, I'll try. So um, would it now be possible for us to vote on this motion? Are folks feeling comfortable enough? There's been a motion made and seconded. Um, I don't see any other hands up at this point. So hearing no other questions, I would ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Um, she'll be asking for the yeas and nays in favor of the motion that's on the table. Uh, Member Busanski? Yay. Member Condon. Yay. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Kaufman. Member Kaufman, you're muted. Yes, sorry. Member Levy. Yes. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll now move to the um, item C under reports and recommendations. Um, this is a rules and policy subcommittee and a requested first and second reading and vote on policy ACE. And I would turn to uh, the uh, uh, superintendent and and others to uh, describe what's needed here. So this revised policy comes to you as a result of a settlement agreement between the district and the Office for Civil Rights. Um, we had a situation in the district where there was non-compliance with an IEP. The parent um, reported non-compliance to district administrators. The district administrators made many attempts to prevail upon the teacher to implement the IEP. And um, when they were unsuccessful, the parent uh, filed a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights. Uh, as is always the case, when OCR took the case, they asked us to conduct a local investigation. In this case, the local investigation was completed by a member of the Student Services Office, which um, 
substantiated the parent's complaint in the documentation that accompanied the individual's report. There were, I would say, several score um, communications from administrators to the teacher directing the teacher to implement the IEP uh, to no avail. So um, on the basis of that evidence, the investigator from the Office for Civil Rights saw that it was essentially a personnel matter. However, the Office for Civil Rights can't become involved at the level of personnel. They can only uh, address district-wide institutional matters. However, um, the, the evidence was compelling that this wasn't a matter of institutional uh, discrimination against individuals with disabilities. And so we were able to negotiate um, a settlement agreement rather than a finding that we were um, discriminating against individuals with disabilities. The revised policy that you have in front of you adds a section. Um, it's a complaint resolution process, which says that if a um, administrator is made aware of a alleged violation of an IEP or a section 504 plan, and is unable to um, resolve it immediately, that that will automatically trigger an IEP meeting or a section 504 meeting so that uh, the parent can confront the teacher with their um, concerns. This was uh, language that was suggested for the policy um, by OCR. We have sent a draft of this revised policy to OCR and they're ready to sign off on it when we notify them that we've passed it. Um, that, will, that will resolve the complaint in this case. If you're interested, um, the individual in this case um, is no longer in that same situation. The individual is no longer in the same school. Um, and so there is a very low um, probability that the individual is still going to um, have, be exposed to the same type of um, non-compliance with their IEP. Okay. Um, would someone like to make a motion to put this approval of this um, policy ACE on the floor, please? Uh, and I'd I, like to, oh, go ahead. So I need to raise my hand. Um, go ahead, Member Fallon. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to approve policy ACE as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. seconded by Member Busansky. Um, is there any discussion? Please raise your hand virtually if there anyone wishes to discuss this further. Seeing none, I would ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Uh, <clears throat> Member Voss. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Mayor David Narkowitz. Yes. Mayor Neckworth. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, two other. Um, we also have other uh, policies on our agenda this evening. Um, and I don't know if uh, rules and policy wishes to explain those and present those. I don't, would that be member Fallon? Yes. I don't know. Okay. It's member Fallon. Okay, um, member Fallon. So we have a first reading of policy DM, student activity accounts. Um, this is um, the last of the policies um, in section D, fiscal management, that we were asked to um, review for the last time we had an audit done. Um, the primary changes, as you can see, are that we are eliminating all reference to elementary school, all references to elementary schools, because they do not, in fact, have student activity accounts, um, and adjusting the language to only apply to the middle and high school. Um, we've also removed all references to our associate superintendent for business, sadly, because that position no longer exists. 
um, and it is our school business administrator who has the responsibility for um, that. Um, we also um, changed language. Um, trying, sorry, going through this. Um, obviously, we changed the language by removing the hyphen from fundraisers because that's what we do. Um, and uh, adjusted statements um, to align with our current practices. Um, so for example, um, that receipts um, need to be made, no receipts may be deposited into the checking account. The only deposits to the checking account will be the initial transfer from the agency account to open the checkbook. Um, and then made references to our existing policies under the gifts section of, um, of the document. Um, we also, um, I think that was it. We also um, made the language under inactive accounts uh, reflective of our practice and our policy that, um, that written notification by the advisor or student officer treasurer to the principal or other authorized administrator um, that the particular activity will cease to be a viable account. If an advisor or student office or treasurer is not available, such discontinuance shall be by recommendation of the principal. So we took out the language requiring a vote of the school committee. Um, I think that those are the primary changes. Like I said, this is a first reading. If you have questions, Ms. Lamica is definitely the one best equipped to answer um, the more complicated ones. Superintendent Provost, you have your hand up. Superintendent. He's muted. Okay. Uh, just Super after, after this item, I would like to go back to the prior agenda item. There was actually one other thing there that wasn't addressed. Was this the ICM? Uh, it's IB8. Uh, IHB. IHB, yes. Okay. I, I'm, I, I'm I, perfectly happy to finish DM first. Okay, fine. Um, let's... Um, so are there any questions about this? It's first reading and we'll come back to you for a vote. Okay, hearing none. Um, uh, going back, I, I guess I kept saying ACE. There was also an IHB uh, policy. Were those part of the same um, settlement agreement, Dr. Yes. Provost? Yes, but IHB doesn't need any substantive change. All of the language is the, for the settlement was embedded in ACE. All we would need with IHB is a vote to... Um, approve it again so that we can update the review date on it. Okay. Move to approve policy IHB as, as presented. Second. There's a second. second. Okay. Is that, um, I don't. Member know, Goldman who, seconded, I think. Okay, Member Goldman seconded, excellent. So um, any further discussion on that? I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member Busanski? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Mayor Narkwitz? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so now we move back to the regular order and there's two policies that are come to us for a second reading and vote. They are BEDB and BDB. Um, yes, yeah, so policy BEDB agenda format. Um, you should all have the policy with the um, changes that the Former subcommittee uh, recommended, highlighted. Um, there was some discussion at our first rules and policy um, meeting of the new committee that um, that we would like to move to have this approved, and so that we are able to discuss this and get some feedback from the new members of the committee as to how we'd like to proceed. So, I would like to um, make a motion to um, approve policy BEDB agenda format as amended. Second. And then okay. 
Yeah, and then okay. I guess our question is, so the primary change that, the reason this all came about was because we realized that the, um, our city charter and our policy and our rules of procedure were not in alignment. Um, and so that was what first brought this to our attention as far as who was, um, who was responsible for the agenda. And so the initial changes we're reflecting that and then one of the um, and we made most of the changes um, to reflect the changes that the MASC had made on their uh, recommended policy but the one thing that we had changed that was a little bit different was we had said um, that the inclusion of such items um, will be determined by a majority vote um, uh, of the school committee during the new business portion of the meeting in consultation with the superintendent so that was uh, this kind of brainstorm that we had had about the way that we could have set the, could set the agenda, but this was months ago with a totally different school committee, and so I have ideas about how this could be um, adjusted that we could pass it tonight, or it could be sent back to subcommittee for further discussion um, after you give us your thoughts. So I'm looking for guidance, I guess, from the committee. Are there any hands on this one? Anyone wish to give some guidance? Uh, Member Busansky. Unmute. Forget, um, I seem to forget every time. Um, I am kind of curious about what others think of this notion, uh, this new way of kind of setting the agenda. I feel concerned. I like the increased openness, but at the same time, I feel concerned just about the length of our meetings as they are sort of adding on a whole new section to our agenda. Um, and that it would, you know, sort of take a lot of time. And I'm wondering, so I, I'm not really sure how I feel about it yet, I'd love to hear from others. Um, the other part that I did want to bring up is I would like to add something further down about um, the agenda and supporting materials um, and also include executive session materials. I'd really like us to figure out a way that we can get executive session materials ahead of time. And I think it should be included in our policy. I think that what we have, um, the way it works now where we have to read the materials at the beginning of our executive session which are often incredibly late at night um and while everyone's sort of talking is just not really conducive to being able to understand the material and uh, be prepared for that executive session in the same way that we're prepared expected to be prepared for our general school committee meeting so just wanted to add that in there thanks so um uh, I believe member Kaufman is next. I just, my only, the only thing I would add before I uh, turn to you member Kaufman is my, my one concern that I have about this concept is while it sounds good, I mean, it sounds in theory that you would um, uh, under new business raise issues. My concern is um, if it requires a vote of the school committee, to basically agree to put something on the agenda, then you're basically deliberating on an issue that was never on the agenda to begin with. I just don't know how you make the case for why you think this should be on the agenda. I don't think new business can be used to skirt the open meeting law. So I just think that's the one trap that we would fall into. That we would just have to be careful and get some guidance on. So I'll turn it over to member Kaufman. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a Two or three quick things. First, I, I fully endorse uh, Member Buzanski's idea. I think um, not having the materials, from my experience, not having the executive session materials ahead of time really um, hurts the process. So um, I, I think there's any number of ways that folks have figured out um, how to get information out in a confidential manner. And I think we need to uh, ensure that the same information that goes out 48 hours in advance for our regular agendas include executive session materials. Um, I also concur with what the mayor just said. I, I, I guess I don't even, I, I don't fully get what the intention is of this paragraph. 
Um, I don't know whether we're maybe Ms. F Ms. Uh, Member Fallon could answer quickly, but I, I don't know if this is about adding things to an already scheduled meeting and that we would add a, another item that's called new business. I guess I'm just really confused. What what is this in a practical way? Can you, Member Fallon, could you just explain this? What this addition? What this means? Yeah. So the the conversation. I gosh, it's so many months ago now. It's hard yeah. to remember. Was essentially that there was a concern by uh, members in the past that they wanted items on the agenda, and they were either being told they couldn't be put on the agenda, or they were put on the agenda because somebody asked, and the rest of the members were confused as to why they were spending time on something that they didn't feel was necessarily as important as other things that were on the agenda and our meetings were going till midnight and one o'clock. Um, and so the question was how we could better all um, take part in the agenda setting process. Um, I think that the when we did the first reading, all of the concerns that everyone's brought up um, definitely resonated with me and I would actually you know, I think that maybe the process, this, you know, transparency of allowing um, items of business to be suggested by any school committee member, staff member, or citizen, we should definitely leave that in there. Although that was actually on our old policy as well. Um, and just have the inclusion of such items be determined um, at, at the discretion of the chair of the school committee in consultation with the superintendent and vice chair. I, I think that at this point, um, that maybe we do need to just um, have this policy updated to reflect our current practice and maybe revisit it in a few months when we see how it's actually working for us. Um, it's just that it was on the agenda for a second reading and we've put it off for months. Um, the other option would be to bring it back to the subcommittee um, to rethink how agenda setting could um, reflect everyone's um, preferences for what appear on the agenda. And essentially it was this agenda, including customary items of the business. Our, our agendas are typically the same thing. They're um, a roll call, they're public comment, they are the consent agenda. We go into um, you know special guest reports from committees, the superintendent's report. It follows this set pattern. It's just what, uh, how do you get additional items included? So that was the primary focus of that we were trying, that was the primary question we were trying to answer. Okay, so um, thank you for clarifying that. That was very helpful. So I think, you know, putting in writing how things get on the agenda makes sense. I think what we currently have works for me, but I have no idea if it works for other folks. And I just think there was some confusion in the past as to whether we contact just the chair or contact all three people that set the agenda. And I still think actually that's confusing. So at a minimum, getting some clarity in this policy as to how things get on the agenda. To me, I would endorse that idea, but um, the notion of having people, you know, vote on that or so, that, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem to add any value to me at this point. So I like your latter thinking on that, Ms. Fallon. Um, the other question I had though, is that we do have this notion of each agenda will include customary items of business that, as listed in the document BED, or BEDB E. And I recall that was something that used to go out with this policy, um, went out to us two or three times, and that was actually a list of what our typical agenda looks like. And I actually had some comments, or one comment on that, that I wanted to address is, would this be a, the appropriate time to do that? What our customary items are? It, it would seem like if, if, we're, if we're saying each agenda will include the customary items of business, and I think, let me be more straightforward, I think we need to come to agreement or at least consider some um, uh, adaptations to that if it's gonna, uh, if, if, we want, if we want it. And I would like to propose one. So you'd like to propose an amendment to BEDB? To the to the policy that's on the floor right now. No, well, I want to I want to um, pose an amendment to BEDB E. So usually, is, yeah. So, um, Mr. Mayor, usually that's the not the policy, but it's filed with the policy as an informational piece. Um, okay. So 
So um, we haven't created it. There are sample ones available on the MASC um, what listserv. I don't know if if we have to vote to approve that. I don't know if it needs to be. I don't know if it's automatically included while talking about this policy, but I assume that it would be okay. Would it be okay to not create it, try to create one tonight out of out of whole cloth and maybe refer that that piece back to the committee to bring forward a BDBE? Uh, that certainly makes sense to me. Would you be amenable to that, Mr. Kaufman? I certainly would. I mean, just note that we, in the past, we have re we have received those at least on two other occasions, and it looks very similar to the way our meetings run. So I don't think it's going to be a lot of extra work, and I certainly would be fine and just um, looking at that maybe as a separate one, which would really talk about what the customary items of business are, and might even get into the um, the protocol for going through those, whether we want to add time frames, whether we want to add roles and responsibilities, just there's a, there's a way that I, I think that talks about the way that our agenda items will be discussed. And um, there's probably a number of ways we can improve on this, I believe. So I'm fine in putting it off if other people are. Yeah, I would love to have that conversation. And I love the idea of time frames. Um, if that could be a future agenda item, I think that would be really great. Right. Well, I think it naturally fits into that BED-E, so I don't want to lose that. Um, so I, yeah, I would agree. If we can do that. So, do, yeah. do, so are we thinking we want to try to approve just a, the, the the finished part of BED and then defer the 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 parts that are still open question or just wait on all of them? Uh, Mr. Gold, you have your hand up and I'll, I'll turn to you. I guess, Mr. Cole. Yes, yes. I guess uh, it follows just exactly what you were saying. Are we, are we amending this document right now, or are we just voting to send the? Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be offering uh, suggestions or thoughts on this. Um, so I, I'm a little confused. Well, um, uh, BEDB. Um, we're discussing BEDB. I don't know that the chair actually made a formal motion at this point. So it's still an open question whether member Fallon, you were proposing to approve it as is or just put it out there for discussion or what your thought is on it. Yeah, because it's something my, that's been I yeah. just I wanted to get it out there for discussion and let everyone know we had the options of approving it, change amending it, or referring it back to some committee for more significant work. Okay. Um, okay, I mean, if it goes to, Subcommittee for more significant work. It sounds like we can then share with subcommittee suggestions for that work. Um, so I'm okay with that last option um, rather than deliberating on all of our ideas right now. So are you making a motion, Member Gold? I'm make, yes, I am making a motion. Um, to refer that to rules from policy? Yes. For okay. further, yes. Okay. Is second. there a second? Okay. Seconded by member Serafi Cox. Um, is there any discussion about this? Member Fallon, your hand is up, but I don't know if you're wanting to be recognized. No? I don't want to be recognized. I just okay. didn't take it down. Member Voss, did you want to be recognized on this question? Yeah, I I'm, I was going to give input in the previous one, but it's appropriate here too. I fully support um, referring it back to the subcommittee and thank them for their work on it. And since Member Fallon asked for input. I'll just echo some of the things um, that I heard that I agree with. Um, I agree. I don't really want to make our meetings longer to have this discussion. And, and I agree with the concern about putting agenda items on during the meeting and voting on them is a concern about open meeting law. Um, my personal experience, and I don't even know if this is the right way to do it, but I it, I agree with what member Kaufman said that it would be good to articulate it. If I have an item I'd like on the agenda or people have brought to me, I just email the three people here that are mentioned, superintendent, chair, and vice chair, and ask to be put on. And my experience has been that um, I get, 
usually it gets on the agenda and if there's a good reason for it not to be i get a reasonable explanation and i felt like this that process has worked for me and so i just that's my feedback that i'm happy with that and my other piece of feedback is the 48 hours prior to the meeting where it says should be distributed i i don't know if it should i don't know if that should be a stronger word than should and i don't know if we could put something like ideally the meeting materials would be distributed um we had talked in our norm setting it's a longer period of time so i'll leave it at that and member kaufman do you have a question yeah just a quick follow-up so if we had ideas to suggest for the standard uh, agenda items. Is that something we talk about now or do we wait until the ED-E comes to our attention? Um, I would say you could certainly forward them to this committee that's gonna be taking them up. That'd be one good way to do it is share your thoughts with the committee and then hopefully they'll incorporate them. And if not, you'll have the opportunity to raise them when it comes back to the full, to the full school committee. Okay, great, that's what I'll do, thank you. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to refer BEDB back to the Rules and Policy Committee, um, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, Member Goldman has her hand raised. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Member Goldman. My apologies. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I just want to also offer my support in referring it, and to mention that um, the completion of the standards and norms was dependent on this conversation. And so that'll just be pushed out. It won't be next meeting after all. And we'll just keep pushing it out, which is fine um, until the agenda piece is settled, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. OK, um, uh, I'll now ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee on this uh, motion to refer. Member Voss? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Motion is approved. OK, the motion is approved. Um, now we have um, a BDB, which is School Committee Officers Policy. Uh, Member Fallon. Um, thank you. Yeah, so this is also a second reading and vote. I think this one is a lot more straightforward and could be approved this evening. Um, it was the same thing that we needed to align the language um, found in the city charter with the language found in our rules of procedure and the language in our policy. Um, as also um, making sure that it was clear whose roles, um, which duties belong to the chair and which to the vice chair. Um, and so I would, um, I think that we had, um, we had used the, the language from the city charter to say that the mayor shall be a voting ex officio chairperson of the school committee. And that as presiding officer at all meetings of the committee, the chairperson will have the same powers as any other member of the committee to vote upon all measures coming before it to offer resolutions and to just to discuss questions. Um, we also added in in number two that um, that the chair will consult with the superintendent and we added in and the vice chair in the planning of committee's agendas. Um, we eliminated number six, which said that um, that they that he or she would be public spokesperson for the committee at all times um, and moved that to um, the section under duties of the vice chair. Um, we also eliminated the word all for number seven, um, just answer parliamentary inquiries. Um, and we also have a parliamentarian that can, that can also be called upon for that. Um, yeah, and added in the language that the vice chair will be public spokesperson for the committee at all times, except as this responsibility is specifically delegated to others by the committee. Um, and then we added the legal reference um, to include the city charter article four. 
So I would move to approve policy BDB as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay, seconded by Member Goldman. Is there any questions about this policy? I see a hand from Member Levy. Member Levy. Thanks. My question is um, in under duties of the chair, item four, appoint subcommittees and then subject to committee approval was taken out. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why that was taken out. Um, yes, yeah, so that, like I said, we were just trying to align the language from the rules of procedure and the city charter, and that language is not in either of those as far as the city charter is concerned. The chair has the authority to appoint subcommittees, and it doesn't say anything about it being contingent upon the committee's approval. And so we were just trying to align the language with the city charter. I guess my question is if we wanted to shift that practice, is this the place to do that? Uh, it would have to be changed first in the city charter before we could change it. Yeah, the, the school committee can't pass a rule that supersedes the charter, which is a state law. So that's why the it's the same on the city side. The city council president appoints the members of the committees of the city council. It's analogous to that. Okay. Next hand is from Member Kaufman. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually want to bring up two um, potential duties of the vice chair. Um, first of all, it came to my attention soon after um, beginning as vice chair that I am also, the vice chair is also part of what's known as the sick leave bank committee, sick, sick leave committee, sick leave bank committee. Okay, sorry. Um, which consists of the superintendent, the president of NACE and the school committee vice chair. And I don't know the origin of this. Um, I was just told I'm a part of it and it's, you know, it's, it's not a comprehensive job, but um, I'm glad to fulfill that I just, didn't know it existed and therefore feel like it probably needs to be uh, formally put somewhere. And this seems to be the logical place. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to add to this or ask for a motion that, or an amendment that to the vice chair committee that they also, vice chair roles that they also serve as a member of the sick leave bank committee. I guess my question on that member Kaufman would be, that's not a committee established by the school committee. That's a, I believe that's a school, that's a committee that's established by the district as part of a joint labor management agreement, I believe. So I don't think it's actually a role that's created as part of the, um, that's created by the school committee. And I don't know, uh, um, trying to think of how best to say this. I don't know that our, um, I'm not sure that our, you, you could currently serve in that role, um, but I'm not sure. That'd be yet another question that we'd have to investigate. Um, Superintendent, do you know the origins of the Sick Bank Committee and where yes. that is formed? Yes, um, it, it's, it is the Sick Bank Committee. Um, it's in all of the collective bargaining agreements. It, the Sick Bank Committee is comprised of the vice chair of the school committee, the president of the union and the superintendent. Okay, so it's part of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, so the question is, if it's enshrined in the collective in, in, in bargaining agreement, would we need to have that in our rules? Um, I don't know. It's not something um, that's- Mr. Mayor, does it not fall under the part where it says that the vice chair of the committee will act in the absence of the chair's presiding officer and will perform such other duties as may be delegated or assigned to them? I mean, is that- do you think that falls under delegated, delegated or assigned? Well, certainly it's assigned as part of the bargaining agreement. So it's, yeah. So I would say that it's covered already under there, but. So I don't, just to answer your other question, um, Mayor Narkowitz, I, it, it, this is, from my experience, this is a not creating um, how the sick bank committee, it's, it doesn't create any new rules or policies. It's uh, only 
we, we make decisions on individual on an individual basis. So I don't think there's a conflict of interest, if that's what you were um, suggesting. And my predecessor, I guess, also was in the same position. So to me, the little I know about it, that's not a concern. I was more concerned just so that it's clear, just so that future vice chairs know that this is a part of their role. And so it might this might not be the appropriate place, but it, but the fact that it's kind of part of the of the um, the part of the contract, which I which I by the way read, so maybe I need to read it again. But I just think we need to make it a little bit more clear. So so if, if whether it belongs here or not, I'm not sure, but it just feels like it needs to be put somewhere, so people know that that's a that's a responsibility. Okay. Do other members have any thoughts or questions on that? Um, so, um, so it the where we have the current policy before us, Member Kaufman. If you wish to make an amendment to it, you're certainly free to do that. Okay. Uh, member, uh, actually, Member Gold has his hand up. Just one second, Member Gold. Oh yeah, I was question? just gonna. I was gonna. I don't know if it's the right time or not to make a motion to. Prove it, or if we're at well, I think I was just I was asking whether Member Kaufman wanted to make an amendment. So, gotcha. Yes. Sorry about that. Yep. So, I would like to make an amendment to add to the, the rules of the vice chair that they serve as a member of the sick bank committee, um, unless unless this changes as a result of collective bargaining, consistent with collective bargaining. Or consistent with a sorry, consistent with a contract is would that be appropriate, Dr. Provost? I I think that would be fine. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded, made by Mr. Kopp and seconded by Member Buzanski. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the oh, clerk oh, to wait. call. Sorry, sorry, I can't find this hand raise button again. Okay. <laughs> um, if we're yes. going to if if you're going to vote to add that language, um, I, I mean, I I don't know that it's necessary to include it, but if we're going to include it, um, should it at least um, be enumerated in the same way that the duties of the chair are, and have number one, the vice chair of the committee will act in the absence of the chair, number two, that they will be public spokesperson, and then number three, they'll serve as um, on the sick, sick leave bank committee. Um, that's all. I'm just asking as if, as far as making it consistent with the first part portion of the policy. Do you accept that friendly amendment member Kaufman? Yes. And I, and it's called, I guess it's called the sick bank committee, but yes, I'm totally fine with that. Okay. Um, uh, so I will now ask the clerk to call the roll on the amendment. On the amendment, uh, Member Busansky. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Fallon. Uh, no. Member Gold. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Levy. Well, I kind of want to know what the no is about, but yes. <laughs> Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Exuberant. <laughs> Member Seraphy Cox. Uh, yes. Member Voss. Yes. The motion passes 9-1. Okay, so now we're back to the main motion. Um, is there any further? Yes. Can I, can I continue? I, I, I had another idea. I had another thing to bring up. Oh, okay. So I, I actually think this, I thought that one would be quick, sorry. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up another potential duty of the vice chair and it doesn't need to be a vice chair responsibility, but I think this is the time to have a very quick discussion about our retreats. And I think that our retreats would benefit from um, maybe more attention to responding to the needs and interests of school committee members. Um, in the past, I wasn't really sure, I never was really sure who actually set the agenda for retreats. And I know that um, it was rare that 
we had an opportunity to discuss what the actual the topics would be. So I, I felt like we can make more use of the retreats when we have them. Um, and therefore, I think the setting of agenda topics and maybe the format, but at least setting the setting of the agenda topics for our retreats is something um, I think I'd like to reconsider our current strategy. And I think it would, could fall into a potential topic of the vice chair to determine topics for the retreat uh, with input from school committee members. And if you make that if you make that motion, I'll second it. <laughs> you want to make the motion? I'll second it. OK, so I will make a motion that additional responsibility of the vice chair um, will be to determine retreat topic and agenda items with input from all school committee members. Did you were you able to get that um, that agenda? Were you able to get that written down, Annie? So this is for retreats, correct? Yes. Okay. This is for our annual or biannual retreats. I think we said twice, right? Yes, I got, I got it. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. There's been a second by Member Bisansky, and you have your hand raised. But unmute, unmute. Right, gotcha. There you go. I'm unmuted. <laughs> I I like the I like what uh, Member Kaufman has proposed. I guess I think if I got the language right, that um, I just would like to include the superintendent somewhere in that. So in consultation with the school committee and superintendent, maybe does that make sense, Member Kaufman? Absolutely. Yes. You have the language in front of you. Okay. Thank you. It could be the vice chair and the superintendent. That's so. Are you okay with that friendly amendment, Member Kaufman? I think the idea was the vice chair will um, collect, will incorporate him. Yes. Um, the vice chair will determine retreat topics and agenda items with input from the superintendent and all school committee members. Ms. Bozanski is nodding her head, yes. Okay. Any other, uh, any comments? Member Fallon. Yeah, so to me, this feels like it is in fact more in line than the amendment that you just voted to approve because it is a general responsibility that's not gonna change. I, I'm sorry that my no vote caught everyone off guard, but it occurred to me, we're trying so hard to align our policies to align this policy with a collective bargaining agreement that changes every few years or more frequently, feels like we're gonna be in this process of change. It's like a never ending cycle of trying to keep all of this in alignment. And so that was why I changed my mind about the, um, the addition of the, the sick bank um, description. But this to me at least feels like a more general description of a, of a duty that doesn't relate to anything else and wouldn't change um, every time something else does so i i could support it any other hands i see none um okay so i'll ask the clerk to call the roll in favor of this amendment member voss yes member seraphy cox member seraphy yes. sorry uh mayor narkowitz yes member levy Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Motion passes. OK. Are there any more amendments to this particular um, policy BDB? Okay, so now we can have a vote on the main motion as amended and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. 
Member Busansky. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. <clears throat> Member Voss. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. So we have a list of future business and meeting dates. Um, uh, the ad hoc screen time subcommittee, Tuesday, March 31st, 2020, online Zoom time to be determined. Rules and policy subcommittee, Wednesday, April 1st, online Zoom time to be determined. Super, uh, superintendent evaluation subcommittee, Monday, April 6th, 2020, superintendent's office, 5 p.m. And school committee meeting with student advisory council, Tuesday, April 7th, 2020. I, um, it says JFK community room, but I would stay tuned as to whether that will uh, yeah. be in person or not. Um, there's no other items on our agenda and I would happily entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, before you do that, I have a question about um, the, the negotiation subcommittee meetings uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of this meeting. So feel free to adjourn if, if you need to, or if I have to say it before we adjourn, I can do that. So do you have a, just a, like a scheduling question or? Correct. Okay. Um, um, go for it. Is it appropriate for me to ask? Okay. Um, so I have a hold on my calendar for Monday, March 30th, as well as a hold on my calendar for Thursday, eight, uh, April 2nd. Should I still continue to hold those times? Um, you should not continue to hold those times because I had a request. I, we were waiting to hear back from NACE and I finally heard back today that I had a request that they make a daytime, that we make a daytime schedule. So I just cleared it with the attorney and uh, the superintendent that um, I believe, and I'll send out an email to you tomorrow that the, uh, that April 9th at 10 a.m. is uh, one that I'm gonna ask the subcommittee if they can make that time in light of the fact that we're in the shutdown and NACE members can do it during the day instead of four or five, six o'clock at night. Uh, so consider that and you'll get an email about that. And if that can't work, we'll go back and forth with them to continue to try to find a date. Okay, so thank you. Um, I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member